today's talk or lecture or whatever we want to call it to be really an extension of that worship. So this is, is there the list of, is there the, no, no, no. Can I get from one, two, three? Oh, they're all, wait. Put them in order. Okay, the tabs. Yep. Got it. Perfect. So I'll start with mine here. Great. Thank you. Excellent. So everything we were doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is worship because we're focusing on who the Lord is, right? And to the extent that we're taking that in and loving him, we're worshiping. So you can worship doing all kinds of things that you may not think of as being worshipful. Can you work on a car and be worshiping? Yeah, you can. If you're thanking the Lord for the car and for your hands to work on it. Can you mow the lawn and worship? Can you paint and worship? All these things should be worshipful. There we go. Um, but, and so I think the content of what we've been looking at Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is, should bring us to worship and should be worshipful. Today, I want it to be like visually bling worship. Like I want us to get lost in, instead of focusing on what's the false story, the Darwin story and the physicalist story and understanding why it's false. And that's a good thing to do. Um, I don't want us to get lost in just that. I want us to spend some time just saying, okay, we know he's there. We know he did this. So can we just marvel in what he did? This is what I want to focus on today. So life is the creation of a master storyteller. <clears throat> um, if, the Dar if, if sort of a brutalist view of life, there is no God, everything is an accident, were true, and it's not, we know, wouldn't you expect life, if it were, if you could pick a version of architecture that would represent life, it would be something like this, just brutalist, raw function, nothing beautiful at all. It just does what it absolutely has to do, because that's what Darwin would deliver. That's what his theory would deliver. If it's only about ruthless survival, then you'd get whatever makes it through. And so here's the ugliest building I could find. <laughs> so that kind of would represent architecture in a Darwinian world. Whereas if that's not true, and we know it's not true, if almighty God who made us, and he made us as creators, if he made life, then you'd expect something spectacular. It will have function. So this is a building and you can go in and use it as a building, but it's way beyond what you need for a building, right? It's, it's, it's extravagant in its display of beauty. Anyone know what building this is? No? Somebody's Cambridge. Cambridge. <laughs> what building in Cambridge? Uh, King's College Chapel. So it's considered to be the finest example of perpendicular Gothic architecture in the world, built by King Henry VIII, who just wasn't a good husband. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> um, and it's gorgeous. And this was back in the days when the, the royals would be showing off. So like the French king or queen would want to have the most beautiful cathedral and then, you know, Spanish and the English, they'd all be showing off. And this was King Henry showing off. It's absolutely stunning, inside and out. Um, on the inside, it has what's called fan vaulting. So there's, that's what it looks like when you go inside. It's absolutely stunning. And not only is it beautiful, when you hear a choral presentation in this space, because it's so vertical, um, so they have a very famous boys choir, King's College Boys Choir, and they do a Christmas Eve service. And the voices just kind of go up there and do something magical up in that space, and it lingers. So very, very beautiful. This is the sort of architecture. If this is the architecture I'd pick to represent what we should expect, or even more spectacular than this, if the God who has revealed himself in Scripture is the one who's made everything, because he's going to reveal something of himself in what he's made. Um, and that's just always the case with creation. So we looked at this statue, it's a statue of David. Here's the guy, Bernini. I've referred to Bernini. He labored over this. I don't know how long it takes to make something like this, but I would guess it's probably years, I would guess, you labor over something like this. And this has to tell us something about the guy, right? It has to, because he spent so much time on it. That's gonna be true of every creative uh, work. Who's this guy? Andy Warhol, uh, 
the Campbell soup cans or, or um, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, that art, the pop art, and he was one of the famous 20th century pop artists, it has to tell you something about the artist. That's the case in music, case in poetry, case in everything. So, if created works always reveal something of the creator who labored over them, then life should leave us speechless because it's going to re reveal something about Almighty God, right? And that's kind of the Job theme, right? We talked about Job. Um, and after God gives Job this sort of whirlwind tour of, hey, this is who I am. Think about this. Uh, what does Job do? Instead of all the complaining and the arguing he was doing with his three buddies who were so helpful, he says, behold, I have, he's saying this to God, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I've spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. So he's brought to his knees in awe of who God is. And what brought him to that is God like showing him his majesty and what he's created, right? So I'd like us to think about that. Um, here's a slide that I show, and it's two birds, right? And on the left, you have the vulture. On the right, you have a hummingbird. Um, and in a Darwinian world, you could say, okay, they both survive, right? And they survive in different ways. How does a vulture survive? How does a vulture eat? It finds dead meat, cadavers, and it pounces on them and eats rotting flesh. How does a hummingbird get calories? It gets nectar from flowers. And so a Darwinist could say, okay, well, that's just two ways you can survive. There's two sources of calories. But what a Darwinist can't do is say, why does a vulture look like death? And why does a hummingbird look like it lives off flowers? So why, it's as though there's a story. It's not just that they survive, they do, but it's as though there's a story be, being told in these creatures because there's no Darwinian reason that there should be something more than just this is what it does. But there is so much more than this is what it does in living things. And that's what I want to unpack here. Anybody know this artist? Dolly. No, God, actually. <laughs> yes. Dolly on the left, persistence of memory, I think. Is that right? And then, so you have these flowing things that shouldn't be flowing. So uh, watches, in this case, in Dolly are flowing. Surrealist um, art form. Um, it reminds me of shapes that God has already, he's already explored this world of shapes. So on the right, anybody know what those are on the right? God made these. Those, those are, what? Did I hear an answer? Pringles, Pringles yes. <laughs> they are diatoms, single-celled algae. So that's an electron microscope image of single-celled algae that have these ornately geometric cases, and I'm showing you one. We could go to a website, where a uh, science photo library if you're interested. There are hundreds of thousands of magnificently ornate different forms for these single-celled creatures, and they build them from the inside. So there's a cell inside there that builds this hard opal-like casing, and then when it has to divide, it can't stretch the casing. It has to make another casing inside it, and the two split apart. There, it's like a pillbox. They go like this and come apart and it builds another casing. Spectacular and art. And it's art that humans, it was totally it escaped human attention until we had microscopes powerful enough to see this. And how many things are like that where God just delights in them? because they, So they honor him and he delights in them and humans aren't even aware. We're clueless. And then at some point we discover it and go, whoa, this has been here all along. Okay, so fish. Here I need to go to my... <clears throat> yeah, we know about fish, but why would there be... What, does this have an HDMI so, so I can go straight to HDMI? Right there? Beautiful. So yeah, there are fish and they swim and they eat stuff and they reproduce, but how about a fish with a transparent canopy, canopy head? Why would there be such a thing? Yeah. Macrofin is a small, dark fish with large fins, a tiny mouth, there. and a remarkable pair of eyes. 
The two green spheres in these video shots are the lenses of the tubular eyes. Behind the eyes is a set of large scales. The eyes are enclosed within a transparent shield, sort of like the canopy of a jet fighter. In front of the eyes are two dark capsules containing the fish's olfactory organs. Typically, Macrofinus sits quietly in the water, using its big fins for stability, while it scans the water above for food. When it spots food, it can rotate its eyes to look forward, to include its mouth in the field of view. We speculate that Macrofinna steals food from siphonophores, elongate animals with tentacles that capture prey that swims into them. And we think that Macrofinna swims into the tentacles and steals the food from the siphonophore. The shield over its eyes protects those sensitive structures from the stinging cells in the siphonophore tentacles. It can also rotate its eyes to avoid predators or to avoid being captured by suckers. Yes, he got away. Okay. This is Bruce Robeson. The so, research it's as though, I mean, why? Why a fish with a transparent canopy head? And again, if this is, were sort of a brutalist world, then indeed, why? Because uh, you can imagine it's very unlikely. All the things that you have to get in place in order to make a fish like this. But if this is a universe created by Almighty God, and he's creative, and he's making life. It's for fun. That's why. Don't you think sometimes he thought, hey, I could do anything. If you could do anything, wouldn't you do some things just for fun, and j just to express things in an, in an interesting and humorous way? And I think that's what we're seeing here. So we'll go to the next one. Um, it's thankfully, so this is, I think if we start the one on minute two, it's the cheetah one, yeah. Um, thankfully, when some, this is National Geographic, and when they know that what they're showing is beautiful, they put it to music instead of something, a siphonophore, stealing food from siphonophores. So if we start at minute two here. This is the cheetah, the fastest animal on land, beautifully photographed by National Geographic to music, I hope. fake little toy on a line. It's to be pulled 70 miles per hour.
Now, we're forgetting how fast this is. So when they show the setup, you're gonna see it in real time, how fast this is. The head is like... Look at that. Okay, we can get it there. So yes, a, uh, no cheetahs were hurt. No cheetahs were hurt in the filming of this. Um, okay, so yes, cheetahs move fast, but that's Poetry. The way they move is just absolutely stunning. Here's something else that moves. Anyone been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium? Okay. So almost everybody's been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So jellyfish also move, and it's also poetry. Um, we won't do the full thing, but we'll start. You want to just start at the beginning? You start at the beginning, yeah. Sorry. Have you ever seen baby jellyfish? Just wait. Babies. <laughs> okay, we can cut it there. <laughs> Little swimming mushrooms. Okay. And here, I just want this to be like a whirlwind tour. We could spend all day doing stuff like this, right? And be wowed by it. And we should. So, flowers. Yes, there's... Oh, I need to plug in here, don't I? They're functional because in the flowering plants, they're sexual reproducers uh, like animals. And so you have the male part of a flower and the female part of a flower, which looks like this in your botany text. It should look like this. There we go. Okay, so this is what you need for a flower to do what it does in terms of just raw reproducing plants, making seeds that bring out another generation of plants. Um, and you could even argue that functionally the petal with, with color, what does that do? What would a function be for the color on a petal? Attracting pollinators for the flowers that use the pollinators. But that doesn't explain what we actually have in flowers, right? because we could spend all day looking at art in flowers. And I just want to go through examples to show the um, striking variety of form in flowers. And of course, humans notice this and know, know that flowers are a remarkably beautiful part of the created order. But I just want to run through some to give us an idea of how varied they are and how exquisite they are in form.
Bleeding Heart, that one's called. Jade. Pink Powder Puff. Parrot's Beak. So, Parrot's Beak. So this is, um, here's something that is only an artist would do. In flowers are bird themes. So you can find bird themes in flowers. And that's only something that, it, that an artist would do. There's no evolutionary explanation for that. That's someone being clever. So Bird of Paradise, you've seen that. Have you ever seen a flying duck orchid? Yes, that is a flower. Par parrot flower. Parrot flower? That is a parrot. And it's a flower. What's that? <laughs> no, it won't speak numbers. It won't squawk. It won't give us a yacht. <sighs> Isaac was so scared and he went home. He still has his yacht. <coughs> Okay, let's look at fish, more fish. So we love these different, I'm gonna look at categories of our creative expression, drama, theater, um, art. So we love fantasy and in fish, you'll find these same genre, these same categories of expression and God is the one who's expressing there. God loves fantasy and shows so in fish. We love romance, right? God loves romance and shows it in fish. We love comedy. God loves comedy and shows it in fish. Have you seen the blobfish? Okay, so the, you could, there's, I just picked some, but there's lots and lots of things that you could pick for this. I don't know if we love horror, but we always seem to gravitate toward it. Oh yeah. The Stargazer. God God does this category as well. Okay. Here's another thing that I want to look at. Life doesn't fit the Darwinian picture of ruthless survival. So in a Darwinian world, in that brutalist world, it's all about survival and leaving your genes on planet earth and that's just not what life is about when we look at it and there's all kinds of specific examples that we look at and say this is not what you would do if it were only about survival so if this were just about brutalist survival there's really three big categories that you should find animals in they should be animals with a good offense and there are animals with a good offense you don't want to tangle with a great white shark there should be animals with a good defense like the armadillo this says an East Texas man was wounded after he fired a gun at an armadillo such as this one in his yard and the bullet ricocheted back to hit him in the face. Okay, so that's a pretty good defense. Or they should be rapid reproducers like mosquitoes, right? And these things are out there, but think of all the things that don't fit into any of those categories that are also out there. Okay, so a snail is a slow moving piece of meat. Um, with a shell on its back, which is a defense, but birds can just pick them off and eat the meat from inside the shell, right? Yeah. But, and a slug is a colorful, slow-moving piece of meat with no shell on its back, and they do just fine. Pandas are just there to be cute, right? That's, that's why they're there. Sloths. Any, this is a hedgehog suffering from balloon syndrome before deflating. So I, I contend that any animal that can have balloon syndrome and have to be deflated is not a ruthless survivor. It's just a fun animal. Uh, how about the flightless birds or the birds that have very poor flying ability, but they have other things. So the peacock obviously is, the, this is the peacock. The peahen is pretty plain looking but her taste in dudes, she wants dudes who can really show off, just like humans. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, but why, if this were about survival, so a, Dar a Darwinist would say, well, the reason the peacock is carrying around 
I don't know what it is, like eight pounds of plumage with just decoration on it that keeps them from being able to fly is because the peahen wants that display in order for mating to occur. But why would evolution give you a peahen whose taste is like this, right? Why would a peahen not want, you know, a hawk-like husband instead of a show-off like this? It's because God made, made this for more than just survival. There's beauty and art here, clearly. Uh, this guy no longer exists. What, what bird is this? This is the dodo. And again, a Darwinist might say, well, see, there you go. There aren't any more dodos because that's how bad they were at surviving. But the fact is, until humans killed them off in the like 17th century, this was on planet Earth and did just fine, the dodo bird. And if you look up dodo, oh, I didn't, I don't have, it says a flightless, clumsy bird that used to live in a certain area. So they're, they're not, yeah, so they're just a fun, part of God's fun, creative expression was the dodo. Okay, how about this? Life cycles that by design are longer than they need to be. Because if it's just about reproduction, then anything that can reproduce on an annual cycle should do that, right? But there are lots of things that could reproduce annually that don't reproduce annually, right? So the cicada is one of these. So there are annual cicadas and there are 13 year, Texas has cicadas, right? Like there's a 17 year cicada, there's a 13 year cicada. And so what happens is, have you ever seen one of these? Um, yeah. Kylie, have you seen like a year when there's like, you won't see this creature at all. And then next year, poof, they're out by the millions buzzing all over the place. And then they're gone the next year. And 17 years later, they come out again. So why? That's a neat thing that God has just designed. And those are prime numbers, by the way, 17 and 13. So they don't overlap. Because if you did like a four-year cicada and a, and a six-year cicada, every time, or a three-year cicada and a six-year cicada, they could overlap. But using prime numbers, it's very rare for you to get a, a, uh, a year that the two come out together. So it will tend to be one or the other, yeah. But isn't cicada's life, like lifespan is like 17 years or so? Or yeah, so what they'll do is on their big bloom year, they go out, they forage, they eat everything and mate, and then I think it's either, it's either the larval form lasts 17 years or it's an egg form that doesn't even hatch for 17 years. And then they come out and have their heyday. But there are annual cicadas. So it's not that it's not possible to make an annual cicada, it's that God decided to make different, different varieties. You would never in a Darwinian world get something that foregoes reproduction for 17 years, just for fun. And that's what the cicada does. Um, the century plant, so this is the agave. These are used, you've seen these all over. It's very common in California um, landscaping, probably Arizona too. Yeah, they're all over the place. Uh, have you seen the big stalks that come off them? They're rare, but they'll grow up like 20 feet high. It's sometimes called the century plant because it will persist without the stalk for over a decade, like 20 years. And then one year it sends up the stalk, it flowers, and then the whole thing dies. Okay. So why do that? Because most flowering plants will flower annually. Yeah. Was that a question? No. Was that a stalk going up? Okay. <coughs> Lives that by design are harder than they need to be. So here we got our, we have our um, video. This is the barnacle. Little gosling on flying day. Yeah. Barnacle goose is what it's called.
Okay, we can cut it there. Okay, so these geese build their nest on 400 foot cliffs, 400 foot cliffs. And there's just no, they wouldn't have to do that, but God has made them so that they do do that. And they're not the only animal that has a life plan that involves extreme danger and extreme hardship. You can probably think of some other ones. And it's not optional because God made them to be what they are and that's the way they do it. And so that's the way they do it. Um, up in the Pacific Northwest, did you ever see the, do you ever go to the Ballard and the Salmon Run up in Washington? Anyone's? Yeah, so salmon is another example of this where these magnificent creatures, they hatch in fresh water and then they, after a few years in fresh water, they go down to the ocean and they become saltwater fish and they become huge saltwater fish. And then after a certain number of years, they, their biological clock says it's time to bring the next generation of salmon uh, into being. And they fight their way back into fresh water, up waterfalls, up streams to the little stream that they hatched in. So you'll have a fish this big swimming in a stream that's that deep and they mate, they spawn and they die. And they're dying all the way, they're falling apart because they're a, they're a saltwater fish now fighting their way up rapids to get to the place where they hatched in order to lay eggs and then they die. And so you can actually, you can actually eat these fish. The adults are now dying as they're coming up um, to spawn. But again, why? Because not all fish do this. It's as though there's a story being told through an animal like this. And it's a heroic story. And a lot of them don't make it, right? Because the bears are waiting for them. <laughs> the bears at places like this are waiting for them to be jumping up and they grab them and eat them. So there's a magnificent story that's being told by the creator. I'm trying to remember what video this is. Oh, okay. Wait, no. There's only one video left? Uh, I'm forgetting what video this was, but if we don't have it there, we, that's the only one that's left? Yeah. Okay. Then I forgot what this is. Uh, okay. Sacrifice as a theme in life. That'll be at the very end. We'll save that one for the very end. Um, Sacrifice is a theme in life. Again, in a Darwinian world where everything's out for itself, you shouldn't get sacrifice, but you do get sacrifice. There's a phenomenon in life. Biologists study this. Actually, it's called altruism. So definition two, behavior by an animal that is not beneficial to or may be harmful to itself, but that benefits others of its species. And I've invented a term that I call uber altruism that we talked about in a, in a course that I teach, which is even beyond this. It's altruism on steroids. Behavior by an animal or plant that is not beneficial to it uh, or maybe harmful to itself, but that benefits others of another species. So species A 
doing something at cost to itself to serve species B. That would never happen in a Darwinian world. If everything's out for itself, that would never happen. It's all over the place in this world, which means this isn't a Darwinian world. Um, cottonwood tree. So let's talk about trees reproducing. So you have the flower, you get the seed, and somehow a tree is going to disperse the seed in order to plant more of itself, right? So cottonwood does it this way. These are these huge trees with a big uh, vertical trunk and, and relatively small branches. A certain time of year, there's up in the Pacific Northwest again, there's just cotton blowing all over the place. And it's from these trees. And you can see the little seeds there. Each tree will produce over a million seeds that get blown out in the breeze on these little parachutes of, of cotton and it plants these trees all over the place. If this is possible, if this is a way that a tree can reproduce, and it is, because here it is, then you shouldn't get trees like this, right? So here's a tree that instead of making millions of seeds, makes maybe a hundred or a couple hundred of seeds, and there's no parachute, and it can't fly anywhere because the seed is too big, and it puts it in a beautiful, luscious piece of fruit. So why, and it's pouring energy into this, right? So why do peach trees exist? Why is a peach tree putting this beautiful fruit around its large seed, which is too big to be dispersed the way a cottonwood tree is dispersed? Not that's true of some things, like berries, like raspberries. So birds will eat berries. It's a small seed. They eat the berry, and then they poop the seeds. So that's another method of see, I don't. If anyone's ever pooped one of these, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> there is, that's not going to be possible with this. Steve, did you have a hand up? Yeah. Okay. Was this purely Christian? For us. A Darwinist can't say that, but we can. The reason peach trees make peaches is for us, not for the peach tree, right? So we benefit from the peach, and that's why the peach tree makes peaches. Think of all the things that are like that. Avocados are another one where the seed is much too large for seed dispersal. It's a very bad design if it's only about throwing seeds out there, but it's not. It's about guacamole. It's about, <laughs> it's about healthy food, and we eat avocados. That's what it's about. Uh, there are examples of this again in the fish. So this is the Norwegian orca eating herring. And um, a Darwinist has to come up with different stories here. And so they'll say that schooling in fish like this is a defensive behavior. It's actually not. It doesn't work because when the orca slap their tail, they, they stun, it stuns the herring and they just are motionless and the orca will pick them off like fruit off a tree. But they only eat what they need to eat, and then the herring disperse. So it's a design in the herring that feeds the orca, right? So in our world, not the Darwinian world, in the world that's been revealed to us, made by Creator God, some animals are going to have behavior that benefits the one that eats them. And it's not up to them. They don't get to decide how they behave. They're made to be herring. Herring is made to be herring and survive as herring, but also to feed the orca, right? So if these fish were to disperse instead of forming this kind of a school, then an orca would not be able to go after a single herring, right? An orca has a higher top speed swimming, but it can't maneuver the way a herring can maneuver. So they only are able to eat these fish because of this behavior. And they do it very masterfully. Um, in the plant world, I should wrap this up pretty soon, huh? In the plant world, you have the same thing. Um, this is a willow tree, and it looks like a pine cone on a willow tree. Go figure, there shouldn't be pine cones on a willow tree. You, uh, that's the answer to what it is. There's all kinds of these weird growths. If, you're a, if you study trees, you'll find trees with unusual growths on them that can look like warts. That's an oak tree. They can look like barnacles on an oak tree. Anybody know what these are? Cheerios. You're a botanist? Cheerios. Cheerios. So here's a oak tree and you see the acorn, but you also see a bell pepper growing on an oak tree. They are called galls. 
And where's all that snow coming from? Is there a plow over there? Oh. <laughs> Is it doing the parking lot or something? Wow. <laughs> These are structures that the trees are designed to make in response to an insect. So in the case of, of particular oak trees and particular gall-inducing wasps, the mama wasp will inject a chemical into the leaf of the oak tree, and the oak tree will then respond by making a home for the wasp eggs and they'll hatch and become larvae and then when they're ready to come out they come out of the home and some of these homes look like the uh, I showed you the ball and, uh, the ball and stopper so this is a home for an insect I don't know if it's a wasp or a midge or something and then when they're ready to come out there's a little stopper door that they can push out and then they come flying out and again because uber altruism does not fit within a Darwinian framework the explanations you hear of this are, well, the chemical from the wasp tricked the tree into doing this. But there's no way a chemical, a simple chemical, can give the tree instructions for making a complex structure, right? That's just not in a chemical. Instead, the chemical is a signal that says, I'm here, now you do what you're supposed to do. And the tree, designed by God, is made to be a home for these insects. And so this elaborate structure gets produced because the signal was given. But that's the tree doing something at cost to itself for the insect. But that's what the peach tree and the avocado tree are doing. They're just doing something at cost to the plant because it's not about the plant. It's about the whole divine economy. The plant is there to serve other purposes. Um, here's the explanation for uber altruism. The Darwinist has no explanation, but it's in Genesis. <clears throat> and God said, this is Genesis 1, 29 and following, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. So plants aren't just about selfish reproduction. It's not about survival of the fittest. In God's economy, these plants were made to feed the animals. And this is pre-fall. So this is Genesis 1. You know things happen in Genesis 3 that change this whole economy. And then animals are being given as food for animals. Okay, And I think there's a story theme there. Because what, what sort of a theme might that be? After the fall... Before the fall, animals live off of plants producing their food. After the fall, death and bloodshed are required for life, right? What theme is that? It's, it's a gospel theme, right? After the fall, life is going to require death. Bloodshed will be part of how things live, and that's a gospel theme. Okay, so here are big ideas. Life doesn't fit the Darwinian story of a climb to higher fitness. It just refuses to do that. Life seems to be more about creative expression and storytelling even than ruthless survival. And God has assigned to many of the created kinds the care of other kinds. So species A is taking care of species B because that's what it was made to do. And the, I want to leave us with this, and there's one video I want to end on here, and that is science is to be worship. Because just as when you go into the Louvre or some great museum and you're looking at works of art that human creators have labored over, and you're like in awe of those artists, right? That's what we're supposed to do when we go out and look at what God has labored over. It's supposed to be an exercise in worship, and it should be. And I think even unbelieving scientists, they are worshiping when they do this because they can't help it. Um, but they're denying, they're denying the artist, the creator who made the things. Okay, so I want to leave us with a short video. These are two uh, English women got in a rowboat 
and were just trying to cross over to the other side and they happened to have, uh, they took video with, with a phone and they were surprised by something that God put on display in front of them. And they clearly were put into a worshipful um, frame of mind by this. And I don't know that they're believers, but you can see in this by what they behold, they're put into a worshipful frame of mind. So let's, let's run this. Oh, the murmuration, starling murmuration. Yeah, birds fly, they do what they need to do to survive, but this is ballet in the sky. Why would a bird do that? Only because the creator who made them, ballet, is after something bigger than survival, much, much bigger. Okay, that's it. Uh, am I late? Like one more week, what's the next thing? Oh, um, well then let me pray. It's been a delight for me to be with you all. I'm going to have to leave later today. I'm going to stay around for lunch and I've promised some Jeep rides. So, but I'm going to take a trip down the hill to make sure if I don't make it back up, I don't want any of you to, to die if I don't make it. So I'll do the first trip. <laughs> I think it's been plowed. So I don't think it'll be, I don't think it'll be bad. Um, but thank you again for opening up your home to me. It's been a delight. Um, I wish I could spend a lot of time like one-on-one -on -one with everyone. I've had good one-on-one -on -one time with a lot of people um, and it's, it's a blessing to me. Uh, so thank you. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this group that you have gathered. I thank you for the commitment that they have to this thing, Joshua Wilderness Institute, a academic year commitment, but I know it's because of a bigger commitment. And it's a commitment to you uh, because you have committed to these people and brought them into your family. And they're at a really exciting stage of life where some things are clear and you've given gifting and you've um, called them into your family, but maybe some things are unclear, like what happens next and education-wise or profession-wise or mission-wise, calling-wise. And um, that's just a beautiful place to be because uh, we know that you have the answers to these questions and the answers are important. Um, and so it's, it's good and right and okay that there's some struggling to get answers to these. But we know you have them and that you love everyone here. And I thank you for um, the blessing that's been for me to be with them. And I just pray that you would help them to uh, finish out this project with great strength and that you would grow them in you, developing your fruits in them. 
And they, they would really display this um, oneness that John writes about in 1 John, the, the oneness of the body that only comes about because of what you have done to make us one. And so I pray that you would grow them in all of these things um, and they would love you very deeply. And that when the time at Joshua is finished and they graduate and you call them to the various places, that you would use these lives to bless many, many others and that there would be a multiplying effect and that you might even bring people to saving faith through the witness of people gathered in this room. Thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.